with watercolor or any medium, uh, watercolor in particular, lots of water, lots and lots of water, get a lot of pigment on your brush. I'm using a wide three quarter inch or one inch flat brush to block in color shapes. So there is no drawing first in, in this particular uh, demonstration. I'm using the color shapes to do my drawing. Now that may sound a little scary for some of you, but it is quite liberating. You'll see just a pacing. I'm not going fast. I'm just taking my time, put one shape in at a time, and use simple color. And with large color shapes like this, there's going to be plenty of time as I complete this demonstration to add, to come back and add details. There's a reason that I'm using these colors first, and we'll talk about that later as we begin to see what's on the palette. So maybe just make a note and you can come back and watch the video again after you see the palette demonstration to review the sequence of what I'm putting down here. But for now, I'll just let you watch. Big color broad shapes. We've got two figures here, so I'm just blocking in where the figures are gonna go. Very, very loosely playful. And lots of water. Now, here's a shift from the warm color. I've used the cool color on the head. So I'm, I've shifted over to the cool colors and I'm blocking in the cool colors just to kind of get a feel for where it's all going to go, find my way around. Painting in this method is, is very intuitive, so speaking during, during the painting, I'm doing the painting in silence and now recording the uh, particulars of what was going on, I'm doing as uh, afterwards so that I, I can find words. So uh, you'll find that it's easier to just paint and not talk. It's very hard to listen to the creator's cues if you're talking. So you'll see there's pauses in my action, in my brushwork. I have not edited the visual of this video, so the pacing of how my color goes in. Now we're, I'm putting uh, the cool colors over on the left hand side. This is a cerulean, uh, not a cerulean, uh, manganese blue, and you'll see that in the palette to frame in this left hand side. And again, very just loose, bold shapes. I'm using the shape of the brush itself to just block things in. So start with a large brush. If you want to paint bold, expressive paintings, starting with a large brush will take you leaps and bounds ahead of trying to draw first. It's not that we're not going to do drawing, and you'll see um, further on in the demo here how, the, how I use the drawing elements tighten this painting up, but we start loose, cut loose first and then refine. So just filling in a little space. With watercolor, it's very important to leave space between the colors, white space. So you'll see a little white space in between each of my colors. That keeps the colors from bleeding together. Now, you know, some bleeding is a happy thing. Too much bleeding starts to get messy, so just a little housekeeping tip. Shadow shape on the side, so a second layer of color here. I'm still using the brush to define the shapes for me, that make the edges for me. the dabs of color are a little bit smaller. This 
some of these a uh, little bit wet there, so you can use a paper towel to lift it back out. Got a little bit dark. Lift it back out. Gives myself gives me a little more space to uh, refine. Also, if you're painting into a, a damp panel as opposed to a wet panel, the paint will behave differently. Let it dry a little bit. Go up. Drop some color in at the top. So you can see I'm pausing to think or to listen to what the creator is saying. If I'm not um, have a clear signal, I wait. I guess I could say that it would be like a dance with the creator of listening and speaking. So when when I'm clear, I have a, a brush stroke I can make, and when I'm waiting and listening, I, I pause. There's a pause. Again, some detail, but still using the big broad brush. Another layer of detail here, shape detail. You see how I'm letting the brush make the definition of the back of this chair, just to suggest some leaving in there, but not much detail. Same thing down here, dark shape anchors this figure. Simple bold shapes because I want the, the emphasis of the painting to focus on the faces, the connection between the two figures. That's the central part of the painting. So everything else around this painting is all staged to focus on that point. Playing with a few little details here and listening carefully. As you develop your awareness of sensitivity to the nuances of color suggestions from the creator and uh, details and linear details, you'll find that it's um, much more pleasurable to paint and you're not doing it alone. You have a, a partnership going on here. All right, so now I've picked up the watercolor pencil. A watercolor pencil is pigment in pencil form, so this pencil dissolves when it hits the water, gives a nice, beautiful, soft edge. And then if it, as in places where it hits dry paper, it um, is a little more crisp on the line. And that can be softened with a little uh, paintbrush water uh, further down the uh, painting. I have a little scribbling kind of calligraphy that I like to do. Um, my background is in printmaking and um, drawing and um, doing all the etchings for years. I developed a cross-hatching kind of a technique, so I'm using that technique here in the penciling. And my line is a searching line, so I'm exploring the shapes and searching out the edges of the figures and the table and the wine glasses and some of the textures in the foliage behind them. Exploratory, really, I guess I would call it. 
I don't really want to say exactly where the edge is. I want some mystery to be in this painting. I want the viewer's eye to have to do some work. So the excitement of the line and the color and the calligraphy and the spontaneity of lunch under those umbrellas is present in the painting. Not too much detail. Now I'm going to go back with a smaller paintbrush and show you how the, the shadow details can be put in. I've switched to a number six or eight round paintbrush and I'm using fairly strong color but you'll see that I'm putting it in specific places, a little bit of deep red in the wine glasses. Now, in the process, when I'm painting, I'm giving you a very front lobe description of what I was doing. But in the process, while I'm holding the brush, I am not using the front lobe to find those colors and shapes. It's easy for me to sit here and tell you this afterwards. But in the moment, I'm much more in the my spirit is in the paintbrush. My heart is what's speaking in this painting, not my head. So uh, I want you to learn to trust your intuition and hear what the, uh, the color messages and the scribbling messages and the feelings, how the feelings that you have translate into marks and how that marks make magic. You have a particular filter that you are for the creator's inspiration. And you will articulate that in very unique ways. You'll have unique colors, unique ways of putting them together. So your paintings won't look like mine or anyone else's. They will be unique to you. chance for your heart to sing. That's why we're painting in the first place. So a little, uh, some detail shadows on the left hand side in the blues. I've added a little yellow to this manganese blue to uh, push it into the green edge a little bit. Same thing down on the right hand side, only the tones are a little warmer. So a little bit more yellow in the, a warmer yellow in the blue, in the manganese. And some texture, so I'm leaving some of the lighter shapes in between the brush strokes, and then I can go back later and soften those up with a little bit of uh, damp brush don't really want it to get too busy. I think working in water, watercolor is a combination of spontaneity and patience. In France, I painted, I hadn't worked in watercolor since college when I went to France and um, in France I painted 30 very, very small watercolors, postcard size watercolors. And I have found that traveling, uh, the watercolor is extremely useful. It's lightweight. I can do it on a park bench. And um, in Italy I got larger with my watercolors. I got into a six by nine sketchbook and I filled several of those up and I don't even know, maybe 40 or so more watercolors in Italy, uh, more on the second trip. And um, I still don't really consider it to be a studio medium. This one you're watching is 11 by 14 inches. I do find that switching back and forth between mediums is extremely helpful because this trans working translucent like this with the watercolor uh, 
opens my heart to different feelings. And when I step back onto the oil palette, or even the pastel palette, I have uh, a new way of looking at the world. So now let's go in the studio and see what the uh, palette looks like. So I'm going to do this um, palette demonstration in oil paint, but the same pigments would apply to acrylic paint or to watercolor. So you can get the same pigment names. You may have to search around from one brand to another, depending on which medium you want to use. But the same pigments are available in all of the mediums. And at the end, I will um, put a card on there with the pigment names listed so that you can um, write them down. Um, we're going to start with the coolest red, and that is the alizarin crimson. So when you lay your pal palette out, whether you're a novice painter or whether you're an advanced painter, it's a good idea to um, put your paint out in the same sequence every time. Um, I was never really good at that, and I paid dearly for being stubborn. So this is a, is a uh, primary palette. There are two reds, two yellows, and two blues. So I've started with the cool red, alizarin crimson, and beside it I've put the warm red, the cadmium red light. So um, we'll spread them out in just a second and talk about the characteristics. So here is the uh, warm yellow. And beside it, I'm going to put the cool yellow. So the warm yellow I'm using today is uh, French yellow deep. Um, it's also the same as cadmium yellow deep. Um, you can substitute Indian yellow, which is what I did during the uh, two years that I used this palette exclusively. I used the Indian yellow, and we'll get into why I did that in just a minute. Let's go ahead and lay the rest of the palette out. This is the cool blue, manganese blue. And the warm blue, ultramarine blue. All right. Now, a, a lot of my beginning students um, have a, a difficulty with, the, with my use of the word warm and cool. So in color, in painting, everything is relative. It depends on what is sitting next to it on the palette or on the painting, whether it appears warm or cool. So for the sake of this discussion, when I say that this blue is warmer than this blue and that this blue is cooler, what I mean is that this manganese blue is closer to the um, green side and that the ultramarine blue is is closer to the red side. It has more red in it. This has more green in it. Same thing with the yellows. This ha the cadmium lemon has more green in it, and the, ca and the cadmium deep, or Indian yellow, has more red in it. Okay. The alizarin crimson will have a more bluish cast and the cadmium red light will have more of an orangey cast, a yellow cast. So they're primary colors, and a primary color is, is um, from these six colors, we can make all the other colors that we need. Now, we are going to add white. If you're working in oil or acrylic, you will need white. If you are working in watercolor, the white paper will be your white. So I'm going to put, this is a, uh, there's a lot of different kinds of white, and I'm using a zinc titanium white, or that sometimes some manufacturers call it mixed white, and by that they just mean a combination of zinc white and titanium white. Titanium is cool, zinc is warm. When you mix the two together, it's a more of a neutral white. It's my preference as, as a go-to white. Uh, 
All right, so there's a lot of questions about medium. Just for the sake of this um, exercise today, I am using what I have on hand, which is the Galka gel medium. I like it because it doesn't require a cup on my palette. So for general purposes, for me personally, uh, it stays put where I can put it on the palette and it stays put. This is, I find, really handy if I'm working outdoors and the palette is tilting and then it doesn't slide. I don't need a cup that spills, all of that stuff. So that's just my personal thing. So let's test the colors now. Uh, all right. I'm going to put a little white in it so that you can see the color. And we're just going to make a, a swatch palette here. And this would be a good way to familiar, familiarize yourself with your palette when you first, if you're buying your colors for the first time or trying these particular colors after, after um, not having had them. Um, I think it would be helpful to you to to swatch them out. So I'm going to put out um, two different um, values of the same one. All right, now. I'm going to wipe it um, in the rag and get the bulk of the color out pretty good here. And then switch to, I want clean white. Okay. Do it a little stronger. Let's do it a little stronger. The only purpose of putting the red in for, or excuse me, putting the white in for this exercise is just so that you're seeing the saturated color without all of the, um, without the density. So the alizarin crimson is very deep and dense and um, it's very difficult to see what the color is until you pull it out. Make a tint of this one. Okay. So I'm aiming for a, a deep, full density color here and here, and then just one tint. Just, just for basic familiarization with the palette. Now I'm going to switch paintbrushes. One moment. getting a little bit of Gamsol. This is a high quality solvent. It will clean my brushes. You can also use it to thin paint. Um, we'll get into that layer as well. Now let's go back and get some. The yellows I don't need to uh, cut with white. to clean the brush. For those of you who are new at this, I'm wiping the excess off in the rag. Swish the brush a little bit. Again, this yellow, the cadmium lemon. I 
I'm using this one fairly thickly. The yellows can go on thickly. Um, so the cadmium colors are opaque colors. And if the advantage of using the Indian yellow for your, for your, um, for your warm yellow, the Indian yellow is a translucent color whereas this is an opaque color. So it's, it's really nice to have one be translucent and one be opaque. Back to the reds, the alizarin crimson is a translucent, the cadmium red light is an opaque. So the, this one uh, that I'm using, the cadmium uh, deep yellow is uh, opaque, but if I had the Indian yellow here on the palette today, it, you would see that it's transparent. Okay, now let's move on to the, the cool blue. This is one of the most beautiful blues. Now, manganese blue is translucent, and you can see it's starting to thin right there. Put a tint. And the ultramarine blue is opaque. Let's put a little white in it. Try not to get other color in it while we're doing this experiment here. I'm only putting enough white in it to get it um, out of the out of the the dense color so that you could see the the tone, the pigment of it. Now, a lot of people have trouble distinguishing warm and cool when they first start working with it. So that's one of the benefits of working with the palette for an extended period of time. When I adopted this palette in 2013 on my artist journey in France, I continued using this palette for two years plus, almost three years, after I returned. And what that did was eliminate a lot of the guesswork and the angst of not knowing. I, I was wasting a lot of time guessing about what color was what, trying to mix the right thing, being unsatisfied, being unhappy. So it really just cuts the guesswork out and allows you to focus on the color itself because these are pure pigments. We're not using any earth colors, we're not all of that. It, it will give you the space to master color. Now I have added, in, in my own personal palette, I have added several colors back in over the last year and a half. But for f it's been five years since I adopted this palette and this, this palette was the game changer for me, was the game changer. Now I did not give you this tint of this one. Let's get, that one's kind of, it's become dirty, so I'm going to put some clean out here. When you're first starting to work with this, it's important to keep the colors clean and to develop some, some little housekeeping, um, 
some housekeeping rules for yourself. It will help you tremendously in, yeah, there's the tint. It will just make life much simpler for you. So many people tell me how much they really want to be expressive with their paint and be free and cut loose and be loose brushwork. And this, this palette is the key to that. Because by simplifying down to six colors and focusing on just this, it opens up wide all of the other thought and effort that you were putting into trying to figure it out, it frees you from all of that. So this is the, by and large, most liberating thing that you can do for your paintings. Now, once you get your color chart made, I would highly recommend writing the colors in and making your notations. So let's put uh, CAD red light and I'm going to put warm right next to it and then I'm going to put alizarin crimson cool Okay, CAD yellow, it's not writing, cool, and then I'm going to write Indian yellow, because that's the one I'm recommending for you, it's much better than this one warm okay ultramarine warm and manganese Clip it by your palette and use it as a reference point. If you make an ancillary chart, you can clip it with it. Happy painting! <laughs>